Content warnings for this episode include dysphoria, transphobia, mental health, ableism, religion, bullying, and being misgendered. Welcome to Gender Meowster Podcast Network. Genderful is a talk show featuring non-binary and trans folks discussing various topics and special interests. We kindly remind our listeners that no person is a monolith of identities. All opinions are the speaker's own. This show airs live on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash gender meowster and VODs with show notes can also be found on YouTube. So meowdy everyone, I am Gender Meowster, I use they them pronouns, and I will let my guest introduce herself, per with a P. Hi everyone, my name is Nick, I'm 33, almost 34 next week actually. I use the pronoun they them and per pers. Um, I work in um, quality control in call center, I'm fluent in French and English, and it's a very, it's an honor to be here with you all. I'm very excited to talk about what it's like to be a little bit older and being queer, um, what was pre-internet, and why it's important to have a bridge between older people and younger people. I also had a very nasty cold last week, so my voice is a little croaky. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but um, And I tend to speak a little fast when I'm nervous, so we'll try to slow down um, to make sure everyone can understand me. And my interests are TV shows. I adore book binding, um, different fan fiction that I like, and I adore video games. Nice. Do you have a, a favorite video game or like a top three if one is not enough? <laughs> <laughs> uh, top three would be Ocarina of Time. I grew up playing this game in my, you know, in my room for hours on end. Um, I really liked um Pokemon also. I used to play on my Game Boy Color with the cables so we could exchange Pokemon. So I've been playing this these game for a long time. And recently Stray just shot up in my top three. Nice. It's a very recent game, just got released, but I yeah. played it and I passed it in one day and I adored it. It's a gorgeous game, super fun to play and beautiful graphics. That's awesome. How many hours did it take you to complete Stray? Mm, probably a day the full day and we were like two people passing around the remote control nice. so like I wasn't the only one playing sometimes I had issue with some steps of the game so I would pass the remote control to my friend would do the, these parts and then I'd grab the remote again and do all the looking for clues stuff and he'd fight the monsters so we had a good team going on that sounds so fun. Um, I I also acquired Stray recently. I haven't tried it yet. I'm saving it for stream, but I my schedule's sort of full, so I have to wait like two weeks <laughs> to try it out. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but oh, that's so fun. I love that. I I've even seen like the modding community are modding like pick the color of your cat and cat farts. <laughs> yeah, communities are amazing. They're the help develop stuff like that i did see that you could customize so that's something i'll look into because i would love to play with my cat <laughs> yeah so fun i love it um well awesome i'm so grateful that you're here nick um you were recommended to us by um lexington aka trans griffin and um it's it's so fun to have you here on the show i'm very excited to be here i I love participating in projects like this, as we'll see when I talk a bit more later about it. I've been always involved with queer projects. I've always been volunteering for queer causes. So I'm very happy when Inkseton reached out and asked me if I would like to be here. And I said, gladly, I would love to be here. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, so I have a couple of questions that I typically will ask all of my guests. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is... What are some things that you can trace back to your youth that indicated you might be trans one day? Um, the best story I have with this is I was very tomboy when I was a teenager. I would wear boys clothes. I would tie my hair in buns because I couldn't have short hair. So I would tie my hair so they would be hidden and would wear hats all the time and trying to be as masculine as possible. And when I turned 17, my mother sat me down and told me I needed to dress as a girl because I was a girl. 
So I decided I would become the most pink thing that ever walked on earth. I just started to become the personification of the pink color Mm -hmm. um, from my hair to my clothes to the stuff around me to the color of my room. Everything was pink, pink, pink everywhere as a, you know, here you go, mother. I have done as you wished. (laughs) I am now the pinnacle of femininity. Um, but I was just a way of, you know, trying to um, confirm and but in a snarky way, you know, it was just mm. I would my name was Pinky back then. I <laughs> requested my mother call me Pinky and I was very, very it was excessive, the pink thing. But <laughs> it was my way of, you know, rebelling against this opposition <laughs> or like you need to dress a certain way and act a certain way. And I. I did not enjoy that at all. So I rebelled, rebelled in my own way. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's so gender to be like, I'm going to overdo it. I'm going to, I'm going to out feminine you and it's going to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, at one, on my 18th birthday party, they were kidding because everything was pink. Like uh, they even pull up like pink sheets on the wall. And mm-hmm. my mother was like, I can't find my daughter. She's hidden in all the background, you know? And <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's that's it. You get it. Now you get what I was trying to do. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, what's your favorite color now? It's still pink. Actually, I kept Pinky. When I changed my name, it became my middle name. So I still nice. have the name Pinky to this day. And so it's not something that I ever let go. Gender has no color, has no gender. I still stand by this and pink. I am pink. I'm bright. I'm shiny. I like to have fun. So pink is a great color for me. I love that. That's so nice. <laughs> Trans Griffin <laughs> says malicious compliance at its finest. <laughs> exactly. That's that's a great word to define me. Malicious <laughs> compliance. Yep. <laughs> I love that. That's so fun. Yeah. Um, so how is your how is your relationship to gender evolved over time? Like clearly you're you're now this they per being. Um, yeah, tell us more about your journey from there to now. Yeah, it went from extremely feminine to rejecting gender completely on the full scale, whereas I I actually moved because I grew up in the French province of Quebec, and in French everything is a gender female or male everything there's Mm -hmm. no it there's no they so it it was a great cause of um, you know dysphoria we we, it it was dysphoria of being constantly misgendered so I moved out of my French um my French environment to an English environment and then I started to evolve more with they them pronouns um starting to let go of the binary and identifying more as nb and non-binary and trying to even with my surgery and my process with testosterone i really wanted to be as androgynous as possible and um i arrived with per pers because i was talking with an older um friend of a friend will say um i was saying oh i can't never wrap my head around they them and just as a stroke of genius, I just looked at them and I said, well, you wouldn't be able to handle my pronouns because they're per pers. And that person's jaw just fell on the floor and they just looked at me with huge eyes. And I just, I was so proud of that moment of really like shocking them into realizing, hey, you have it easy with they, them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my first time I actually used per pers. And I, I really liked the idea of advocating for just they them by shocking people or by um you know making them realize hey you know pronouns are important and you need to be able to understand slash use them Mm -hmm. so that was my journey with purse i still use it a lot on the internet um i've moved back to my french um family my french province so that's something that i had to let go um sadly because i had to go back with um male pronouns um, so that's even something we need to consider to like language. That's something that um, dysphoria within the language is something I never realized before I came back here. You know, I spent so long 
in the English living world that when I came back here, I had this shock of like, right, I can't use my preferred pronoun here. Like, how am I going to do? And it's always this constant conversation of like, my pronouns are he, him, and please respect that. So mm -hmm. it's constantly trying to advocate for my own gender. And it's something I do willingly and gladly because it's important. You need some people that stand up for everyone. And I'm the kind of person that will stand up and speak out loud for everyone because I believe we have to help each other and build bridges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's been, it's been really powerful. Um, this, the discord community that sort of sprung up because of the gender master thing that I've been doing on Twitch, um, it really sort of got into the swing of things during COVID and the pandemic. And, um, you know, I, I went hard in making that community space because I wanted a place for all of the gender diverse people who maybe like had just gone to college and then they had to go right back home because of stay at home and like all of the, um, just taking care of ourselves by social distancing. Um, and so it was just like, Oh gosh, let's make an online space for people to be like trans and genderqueer and queer um, because maybe they have to go back in the closet. There was just sort of a, the opposite of an exodus. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, COVID so. has certainly thrown a ratchet and so many plans that I had, so many things I wanted to do and... Mm -hmm. And it almost impacted my surgeries too, which was very stressful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, both my wife and I had gender confirmation surgeries during the height of the pandemic. Um, the pandemic is still happening, by the way, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Please wear your masks. But um, we we have a vaccine now. So if you're listening to this and it's been 10 years and you don't know where we are on the timeline of things, like by now, most of the people have access to vaccines. Now, if people are choosing to take them or not is a totally other conversation. But those who want them can have them now that's where we're at <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um yeah so um the next question i see here i imagine lexington wrote for us perhaps how did volunteering impact the way you see life um i started volunteering when i was a kid my grandmother I uh, used to volunteer at this thing called Foy Lumière. It was a very Catholic thing. I grew up in a very Catholic family. And um, it was basically for disabled people that would like to do pilgrim in this um, basilic that we have near where I grew up. And um, my grandmother would use to bring me because, you know, I was this cute kid that would love to play with anyone slash everyone. It didn't matter to me if you were neurodivergent or if you had physical handicaps. It didn't matter to me. I was friend with everyone. So my grandmother loved to bring me around because I was just a sunshine person and everyone loved to see me run and scream and have fun and play with everyone. So uh, very starting very young, I was introduced to the benefits and the impact of volunteering, um, especially in, for me, my introduction, of course, was with disabled people. Um, and then I started to grow up, and then I did Katimavik, which is a youth program in Canada where they send you during nine months during, in three different provinces, and you do volunteering. So I was working somewhere um, for example, when I was in um, New Brunswick, I was working for a hospice. So uh, during the day, I would work at the hospice and then we'd go back home. We were 12 people living together and we'd go mm. on road trips and would explore. So this youth program really opened my eyes to even more the importance of volunteering, but more the communal level. So before I'd see it on just, you know, more closed circle with, you know, just disabled people, but that opened my mind to, you know, hey, there's more than disabled people that need your help out there. And it really opened my eyes to all the different struggles that were around us. As someone who grew up very privileged, it was very eye-opening to see, hey, lots of people can use your help. Um, then when I started to work, um, I was part of LGBTQ um, committees as much as I could. Um, I worked for TELUS and I was part of their uh, spectrum, which is the LGBTQ group. I loved being part of this. It was volunteering. So on top of my work, I did that too. Um, something else again, volunteering. And then um, 
as I started my transition, I helped build a line for youth, queer youth called QChat. It's mm -hmm. based in British Columbia. It was basically in Canada. If you were a queer youth, the youth line couldn't handle specifically just the queer youth. So mm -hmm. um, some people created a helpline just for the queer youth of the West of Canada. And I helped build the line and I helped uh, create all the, um, how you would well, call the call flow. So how you talk to when people call you, because I have background in call centers. That was kind of stuff that they needed. Someone who knew how to handle call center stuff. So I helped build that and it was really interesting. So I've always been volunteering. It's always been part of my life and it's something I will continue to do. And it's something that as much as I can, if I, you can just remember one thing from me today, it's go volunteer. It's find a cause that you like, find a cause that you enjoy and go spend your time there because you'll meet amazing people and you'll create such a great community around it. Yeah. Oh, that's so wonderful. Um, so, so you have a multitude of identities, um, that you sort of have mentioned. Um, so not only are you gender diverse, um, but you also identify as asexual. Can you tell us more about why it's important to talk about asexuality? Of course. Um, when I was a teenager, I said that I was broken. Actually, from 14 to 24, I used to say that I was broken. All my relationship would break down. I couldn't identify with people around me because sex was not interesting. Slash, I didn't have that feeling. Slash, I wasn't really repulsed by it, but I didn't have, the, I didn't seek it out. I didn't fall, be, I wasn't forward with it. So it was really hard for me to understand why I was the way I was because I didn't have any resources. I never heard the word asexual until I was 24. Never heard that word before. The closest I heard was spinster, which is like not even close to what asexuality really is. So that was my first time I was on Tumblr and someone talked about the Avon forum. And that was for me the way that I finally came into and I was able to put a label on what asexuality was, which is which helped me um, which helped me stop saying that I was broken because I'm not. It was very important to me to find the word to help me say instead of broken, now I can say asexual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and asexuality is a spectrum too, right? Like yes. there's, there's so many different bits within asexuality. Um, so how did you, how did you discover your own? So you mentioned the Avon forum. Is there any other, yes. were there any other breadcrumbs or clues along the way that kind of helped you out? No, that was really, when I was on Tumblr, I literally said always I'm broken. And when mm. I saw on Tumblr, someone said the Avon forum, and I was like, what is that? And then I clicked on it and it was asexual. I was like, what is that? And I started to read because I'm very curious. So, of mm -hmm. course, I started to read. And when I saw the definition, I was like, oh, my God, this is me. That's mm -hmm. me. There's people like me. And I saw the number of people in that forum. And I was like, I'm not alone. So it was such like a lightning strike of like, I'm not, you know, I'm not broken. I'm not alone. It was such a revelation and it was such... For me, such a game changer. It really mm -hmm. helped me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how how has ACE representation changed over the years? And what should change now? Like what's happened so far and what are sort of the next edges of evolution? It's been up and down, honestly. Um, I've seen highs, I've seen lows. Um, of course, we can talk about... Um, Asexually without aphobia, of course, something that is rampant. Um, might it be people that say that asexuality doesn't exist? Uh, you need to have therapy, you need hormones, you need someone to fix you, you need someone, you haven't met the right person. So there is a lot of challenge on the side of being accepted. And on the other hand, I've had some other people tell me, I wish I was asexual because during the height of the pandemic, you know, can't meet new people, can see anyone. So joking me, people would say, hey, I wish I was ace because I wouldn't have to worry about hookups and stuff like that. So it goes to both ways where, you know, you have the 
the negative bad stuff and then you can see some light you know hey yeah that's right I didn't have to worry about that about pandemic you know I I was I didn't mind I was fine I was alone it didn't matter you know I had my blanket I had my stuffies I was enough for me you know so it's been a very long ups and down and there's even I've seen erasure of the ace culture. That's something I'm gonna touch on a little bit later. But mm -hmm. um, for me, that was a huge blow because the ace community used to be very thriving on Tumblr. There used to be all these amazing signs to recognize each other, and that got kind of striked down with the pipeline from ace phobia to transphobia. You know how it is easy once you step into the hate to keep on dwelling into the hate. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of. I've seen ace phobia as kind of a stepping stone toward the more intense transphobia that we see today. Hmm. Um, I see it as that's where the the root of the evil started. That's how I see it. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and I'm also curious about like Tumblr as a platform. Like that's that's definitely something that I think people in their 30s and maybe 40s yeah. are like really into. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also, I'm about to turn 33 next week. So I think I'm about a year younger than you. Um, yeah. but I don't, I don't think I have a Tumblr account or if I do, it was like one I made in high school for like a minute and then I stopped using it. <laughs> um, so I wonder like what, what the ACE communities are like on other platforms. Like mm -hmm. I know that, um, Reddit, for example, has ACE spectrum, um, spaces, um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I feel like my discord server in particular is pretty ace friendly because we're safe for work. Mm -hmm. A lot yep. of queer spaces are very like horny on main and it's a lot. It's like, yep. Yo, <laughs> yes. Tone it down a little bit. <laughs> so, <Yep. laughs> um, you know, we're still sex positive, but it's also like, but also keep it safe for work here. Cause a lot yep. of people are on the ace spectrum. Um, you know, I feel like, um, especially so my my wife is trans femme and she's had her bottom surgery which she's we've documented it on youtube like it's way out there so i'm not like outing her or telling her story that she hasn't already told publicly um but it has definitely landed her more in the a spectrum because not only did she mm -hmm. lose testosterone with the removal mm -hmm. of some body parts she didn't need anymore um but she also like you know it's it's taken a couple of years for the nerve endings to even start working at all down there. Mm. And so um, she's been this sort of Demi Ace something kind of flavor for a while. Mm. And um, I think it's important to talk about that that's normal, that that's a thing that can <laughs> totally happen. Um, you know, for the, the trans masculine folks on HRT, sometimes you get less Ace than you were before. That's also real. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> I, won't, I won't go too much into details because i don't want to squick anybody but um yeah it's it's fascinating how like um not only sexual identity but also like sex drive can change over time within like transitioning so and um <laughs> so so how does one find community with other east people now like we mentioned a couple of platforms but i wonder if there's yeah. some other resources you have in mind you'd like to share um, for me, Tumblr was because the downfall of LiveJournal. Mm -hmm. LiveJournal is, you know, <laughs> that's old. <laughs> so LiveJournal, when that crashed down, I moved to Tumblr. And that's where mainly I found my community. Um, that was, I'm still on Tumblr. I'm still very active. Even the link I sent to promote is for my Our Flags Mean Death blog. So I'm very active on there. I adore Tumblr. Um, for me, it's a lack of algorithm. On there so compared to any other platform you don't have an algorithm pushing some random stuff at you it's just people that you follow the stuff they post that you see which is amazing and it's in chronological order which is crutches an itch in my brain that is uh, very peculiar mm -hmm. <laughs> um to find a community it's also important to think about real life it's important to go out and to have connection with real people i know we talked a lot about community online but it's great. I have a big community online for diverse, you know, interests slash um, 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 exactly like your Meowster Discord. So I have different online community, but it's also important to have um, real life community, to have people around you. And I know when you're younger, it might seem 
impossible or hard or it's never gonna happen to you, but it will. It takes time, but it will happen. The connection will come. You will meet people that are like you. You will build a community and surround yourself with people that think like you, have the same value as you, and see their life the way you see it. Mm-hmm. And it's something that you have to keep in mind when you're young, because I was distressed when I was younger. that I wouldn't find that community. I would never find people that were like me, broken, that I was thinking back then, but, you know. Um, I never dared to hope that I would find a family, a community, um, a circle of friends that I would be comfortable to be myself with. But it happens. It happens. Mm -hmm. You just have to build it. You just have to work for it. But it'll happen. It'll happen. Yeah. Um, So we just bought a house in April and had a housewarming party. And um, it's like the first gathering we've had in years because COVID and all of that. And half of the party was like my wife's um, software engineer coworkers. And half of the party are my like queer and trans friends of various flavors. And then there's this little bitty intersection of like the coders who are also trans. There was two or three of those also at the party. And so it was just like, so, so fun to have like 10 trans people in my house all at the same time. Wow. It's so common to have <laughs> trans coding people. Like I know a couple too. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely it's a real thing. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um oh it's so fun. So so I feel like uh folks on the ace spectrum have a like a very specific culture. Like I've yes. seen plenty of memes about asexual mm-hmm. and like garlic bread comes to mind. Um, mm-hmm. can you, can you talk a little more about what is ACE culture like for those who are uninitiated in the silliness? <laughs> of course, the first thing that comes to mind is cake is better than sex. That was the <laughs> first asexual meme I've seen on Tumblr. Um, it had the, it was a cake with the asexual colors so gray, purple, white, and black. Um, the other thing that I saw later was the black wings, black ring, sorry. <laughs> so wear a black ring on your um, index, um, your, ring um, finger. your ring finger. Yes, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, what's this word in English? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so wear a black ring on your uh, ring finger was a um, way to identify ice people. I did wear a black ring for at least five years before it fell out of... Um, People didn't know what it was anymore and mm-hmm. it even fell on Tumblr. So sadly retired my black ring. Um, it was also dragon, everyone liked dragon, hoarding stuff and things like that. And one thing that also fell out of use that I'm very sad about is use the ace of each uh, suite of card to identify yourself as ace. So for example, if you wear a spade, an ace spade, your asexual sex repulsed, I can't remember all of them at the top of my head, so don't quote me on these. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I re- those I recall were spades and hearts. A spade was asexual, a sex repulse, and heart was asexual, but um, not sex repulse. So mm-hmm. the two of the suite, I can't remember. But that was b- widely used. Like you would go on someone's profile on Tumblr and it would have ace of heart or ace of spades. So you would know right away it was a coded language for us to just easily identify each other's as asexual and also fell out of favor in something I find really sad. I think on my Tumblr, I still have it on my personal Tumblr and my, my main artsy Tumblr. I mm-hmm. still, I'm pretty sure I still have Ace of Heart um, because it's a little piece of asexual history I want to keep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. So many, so many evolutions of, of things it just keeps yep. going um yep. so what was it like to grow up as a queer kid before the age of the internet it was well it was different for sure um i play outside more <laughs> you know i had to find ways to entertain myself more um and we grew up very very poor so i had to make do um, i read a lot that was my way to escape it was my way to create my own world was my way to find subtext and make my own stories 
also wrote a lot. I adore to handwrite. Even to this day, I still handwrite a lot. I do journaling, mm -hmm. I do bullet journal. So writing and reading have been my escape, the way that I forged my own universe, my own little world, when I grew up in a very heteronormative society, in a very um, neurodivergent and friendly world too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and even hand wrote the the questions that we decided on I for did. today. <laughs> I did. I wrote all my answers. So each question I have the question and then in a different color I have their answer. So yeah, I'm I just love to write. When I was in high school I thrived. I had my huge pencil cases filled with all the rainbow gel color you can think of and my my diary was always full of glitter pen everywhere. So I've always been, um, I've always loved him writing. Yeah. What can we learn from queer people who grew up without the internet? The importance of having an IRL community. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a little, you know, you can tend to isolate yourself if you're only online, but it's important to have people that you can meet that you can feel their energy that you can um, create um, either activism or that even help your community volunteering i think that older generation were more active you know into activism that we are um they were more in the street than us of course they won battle that we don't have to win today but i think there's a little you know, lacks there where we're not as vocal about our rights than they were. Mm. Um, it's different, right? We we can yell in a void on the internet, but they were out, you know, on the street. They were out fighting. So I really admire the older generation for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is special among the queer generations that grew up or are growing up during the age of the internet? I think that it's so great that you have access to all these things. I started to transition when I was 30. I discovered I was sexual when I was 24. I didn't have words. I didn't have community. Um, you know, just in high school, now people have queer a group. Like, we, I didn't have that in high school. I barely had that when I was in college. It was starting. It was basically the gaming group was kind of the gaming slash queer group that was kind of mm -hmm. the unspoken rule if you'd like but we didn't have any kind of resources that the younger generation have today and i'm so glad that they do and i would fight any day for them to have access to everything that they have i do not want any younger person to go through what i went through mm -hmm. never never so i'm very happy that the younger generation have such an easiest access, more open-minded parents, more open-minded teachers, more open-minded environment to support them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So our, our friends in the Twitch chat are having a side conversation about yeah. the phrase amato normativity or allo normativity. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're defining amato as the assumption or a modern normativity as the assumption that everyone is better off with a romantic and or sexual partner. And they're saying yep. that a motto comes from the Latin word amatus. Interesting. So there we go. Read that yes. <laughs> New world of the day. <laughs> word of the day. <laughs> it is like, that's funny. Um, actually I saw my, my aunt yesterday and she was my inspiration growing up because she never had kids and she was constantly pressured and one day I must have been uh, I was like eight or nine or ten like very very young and she told me if you don't want kids tell people you can't have kids because they'll remember it and they won't ask you about it don't say you don't mm -hmm. want kids say you don't, can't have kids so very young I understood hey yeah society and even my mother pressured me so hard to have children she that to this day she she is mad and she deeply 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 hates me for not having children because that's what she wanted me to do I was the first born so my task was to give her children mm -hmm. so yeah it, it's it's very entrenched. It's very perverse, in my opinion, that everyone must have children in the climate that we're in today. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had, like, as 
as an older person, I have friends who have children and I've heard them say, if I could go back, I wouldn't have kids. <laughs> so, well, okay. One, the planet's already <laughs> overpopulated. Uh, mm-hmm. Two, you could always uh, just either never partner or partner with another trans person who's sterile and then it's not an option. Three, it's expensive. It's Having so kids expensive. Having kids is incredibly expensive. Like, just, just to live somewhere, like, buying a house is impossible now. Rent <laughs> is sky high and it's impossible to find places to live. Like, it's just, I look at everything, might be so, might be money wise, might be social wise, might be mm-hmm. earth wise. To me, I wouldn't want to bring a child in this world personally when I look at stuff. Yeah. Children in this economy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you need a polycule of seven people to just buy a house. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> um, what was queer representation in media like pre twenty tens? It was bad. Yeah, it was let's, bad. Let's be frank. Um, I have one example in mind. Um, when I grew up, I watched this show called You South. It was a Canadian show where a Mountie goes to Chicago and he started investing all these crimes. And he's a very square dude. He says, thank you. He opens the door. And of course, he has Canadian money, which is different colors. So they're all always in awe of him. And the ending is kind of open minded where he leaves with his longtime detective partner from Chicago and they both leave into the wild, mushing away with dogs. So that's the ending of the show. It's very open, like... Are they, are they not? And that was the only example that I, that came to mind to me where I saw some queer rep and it was, it was well handled. Like I did look back on it later. I did um, some research and uh, Brendan Fraser, the guy that actually played the Mountie did say that he wanted to have this touch of will they, won't they? So there was, there was some bad rep, but there were some little things that started to appear um, I'm not an expert because, as I said, I grew up in Quebec, the French part, and we have a very, very different culture than the rest of Canada and even America. So the other thing that I have wouldn't be comparable to anything you would know. And in a way, I can't think of anything else. The only thing I have in mind would be due south as like older, maybe Sailor Moon. Yeah, I used to read the Sailor Moon manga and then mm-hmm. I watched a TV show and I was like, what is, what, what happened? What happened to the relationship? It was so especially back then, it was so, so censored. And yeah, Sailor so no Moon and that TV show. But aside from that, mm, it was mostly transphobic joke, come off a big joke. Mm-hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure y'all can think of plenty of example. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the counterpoint is the next question. Um, yeah. What, what are some positive means of queer representation these days? That's amazing because I can talk about my special interest, Our Flags Mean Death. Um, as I mentioned earlier with my blog, Our Flags Mean Death is a new TV show. It's a parrot rom-com staring Riz, Darby, and Taika Waititi. It is queer. It's amazing. It's the best show I've seen since What We Do in the Shadow, which is another Taika Waititi project. Um, I... I, it's my special interest. I am obsessed with this show. I am obsessed with Vico Ortiz, which is a non-binary actor mm-hmm. from this TV show. Um, the, it's just so great. Um, it's a love. It's a queer love story. What's not to love about it? Um, yeah. And it's such. Even the community is amazing. The actors are amazing. They're all humble because they did not expect the show to be this, because it's such a beautiful queer show people just went through the roof with love with it it was best streaming episode for like seven weeks in a row it it was just people word to mouth just made this show explode and I was very impressed with how the cast reacted to it how they handling how they're talking about their characters and what they want to do about it also, I want to mention David Jenkins, the creator of this show, who also did another amazing show called People of Earth. Um, only had two seasons and was canceled. Another amazing show with queer representation. So nowadays we, and that's not even touching um, animation. Um, of course, there's so many queer representation in animation, maybe mm-hmm. Shira. I can't even think, Owl, Howell House. Uh, I can't name them all. Nowadays, children cartoons is, 
amazingly diverse and representative of so many different gender and sexual identity. So oh, Steven Universe, oh, I'm going to forget some of them. And so let's stop naming some before I omit some of them. <laughs> but yeah, um, animation, um, solar opposite, oh, Rick and Morty. OK, I have to stop. But yeah, uh, yeah, there is just so much amazing representation nowadays. And I'm so happy that, you know, people can see this instead of seeing what we saw, you know, a terrible homophobic of homophobic joke and transphobic mm -hmm. joke. I, I'm very happy that you know we've moved past that and we can create amazing queer content that is showing up on my TV and in the movie theaters. That's not something I would ever you know when Brokeback Mountain came back, they made more fun of it than they actually, you know, told it for what it was. It was an amazing, it was groundbreaking. I know nowadays we look at it and we always see it's flaw, but when it came out, this movie was very dear to me. It was, it was amazing to me. It was personal. It was, I saw myself in the story, mm -hmm. um, but the way it was handled because it was early 2000s, it was just so bad. It was. Yeah. 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 Um. <laughs> Alexis, I still haven't seen Brokeback Mountain. I don't know if you need to see it. I don't. I don't know if you do. You might not need to. Um, so, uh, Nick, how can queer representation be made better in the future? Where's our growing edges? I think that it would be um, by getting out there, by writing those stories, by creating those comics, by you know create the content and putting it out there it's not only to create it but it can be hard sometimes to put yourself out there to put your art to put your writing to put your songs no matter the media that you use it's important to try and get it out to make an impact around you mm -hmm. and that's how we're gonna have our voices heard that's how we're gonna get representation i think it's by doing it ourselves mm -hmm. yeah well that's part of what this show is doing Right. Yes. It's like we have over a year's worth of episodes that we've made once a week. Um, and, you know, I would I would tag on that. I've seen a lot of big studios make uh, queer content. I haven't seen a ton of BIPOC queer content. So there needs to be more intersectionality in the representation. Um, there's some there's some out there, but there's not a ton. So. That is one thing that I would love to see some growth around is that I would also love for there to be so many shows with LGBTQ representation that we can no longer list them because they're basically in every show. Like, yep. Like what if? And another <laughs> thing, another thing that I'm a bit miffed about is that all the, all the queer story, most of we're having right now are about teenager. And I, I don't identify with those. That's why I broke back Mountain is still number one for me because that's older people. And that's why our flags mean that shut up to top number best thing ever because it's two older men falling in love and discovering what it's like to be queer. And mm -hmm. we don't get that older people can find love, can be queer and be free. It's mostly, we can mostly see younger people coming you know into their sexuality slash queerness mm -hmm. so that's something i would like to see a bit more is you know older people coming into their queerness or yeah. older people queer stories you want to see the lesbians that have been married to men for 50 years and then got divorced and met their yes, new partner <laughs> in the in the retirement home or something and like yeah, yeah. you know the trans people that came out and they're on their second marriage. <laughs> yep. Yep. And that All of we that. need those stories. We need to, so people, you know, older people can see, Hey, cause we keep saying it's never too late, you know, but we need to show it too. We need to put it into media, to put into our stories, into our narratives too. Not only the young white, you know, cis boy will find his queer love, we've seen those stories can we expand on something else you know yeah okay so moving on to the topic of intergenerational trans connections um what yeah. would you say is queer eligibility what does that mean um i'm not sure that's not a term i've heard before um okay. i would say 
for me, I think what comes to mind is that whole gatekeeping of are you trans if you have dysphoria mm. versus no dys- dysphoria. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, gatekeeping. Yeah, gatekeeping. That's mm-hmm. that's what came to mind when I heard queer eligibility. I'm not a fan of gatekeeping. I'm not no. a fan of of you know stopping anyone from entering. Well, except bigots. No, that's not true. Okay, of letting anyone who who's identifying with the community. Why would you shut that down? Because everyone wants support. Everyone wants community, and there's already enough people against us. Why would you put? your own people against you so let's mm-hmm. just be open-minded live yeah. and let live and be supportive of each other yeah the thing with an identity um is that sometimes your understanding of your identity can evolve over time and so someone might be identifying as an as like a cis ally one day and then three to six months later realize like oh this thing and this thing and this thing was dysphoria and not just something else like, mm-hmm. or, or not even dysphoria, but like, oh, actually, I don't feel cis anymore. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think it's important to leave room for those, those people who are still exploring and questioning, uh, sometimes referred to as eggs, yes. um, mm-hmm. yep. to, to have space in the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a great example for that. So my neighbor is already pretty, she's an elder lady. She's amazing. I love her so much. But her mother is even elderlier but they're both still they're very close in age she had her pretty young and her mother is i would say she's a trans man egg because um when she learned that i'm going to still use pronoun she because that's how she identifies but Mm -hmm. she was so jealous of my top surgery and she was Mm -hmm. so jealous of the fact that i was taking testosterone and i looked Mm -hmm. at her and i said don't you think that you're a trans man? Like what you're saying is stuff that I used to say before I transitioned. And mm-hmm. it's stuff now that I don't have to deal with now that I have transitioned. Have you ever considered? And it was such a shock to her. She never even thought to see it that way. I'm the one who said, hey, what you're saying sounds a lot like an egg to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I know you're you're almost 75, but hey, here's here's where we're at right now. You sound like me. You do. You sound like a trans man. And I think she would never would have seen this without me saying it, that, you know, hey, not that it's not normal, but what you're saying is a common experience to something I have. You know, she would just she was thinking it's some an abnormal thing that I want to have, you know, and I would say, no, 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 it's not abnormal. You know, how you want to present is how you want to present. But hey, just so you know. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and when you, when you get up into, um, the age of people who are old enough to have two generations behind them, so you may not actually be a grandparent, but if your grandparent aged, um, there's a lot of health conflicts that can come along. And, um, sometimes older trans folks can't medically transition if they are starting at age 75. And so, you know, I've also met, um, either closeted trans people or like non-transitioning trans people who are like, you know, I can't get to where I want to go transition wise. So I'm just not even going to start. And there's so much grief and loss and Mm -hmm. like sorrow around that. Um, And that's why it's important to differentiate gender orientation, gender presentation, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I was trying to explain to her. I said, Hey, even if you can transition medically, you can still present as a man. Yeah. No, that's not something that is can be taken away. And she was like, "What is gender presentation?" So I was like, "Hey, hey yeah, let me teach you something." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you can socially transition without medically transitioning. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's good. It's good to have all these, like, all of this nuance. Yeah. And I feel like, mm-hmm. um, perhaps that is one of the powers of the the queer youth of today is because we have yeah. this international ability to connect. Uh, Mm -hmm. We're having these really nuanced gender conversations at a speed Mm -hmm. that like scientists can't keep up with. (laughs) Yes, yes. It it all went so quickly and I, it's nice to see it evolve. And I personally like the more label I can have, the more easier I can explain what's going on or explain a concept to someone or educate someone with Mm -hmm. specific wording or label that are getting more and more mainstream, you know, hey, you know, not so long ago, you know, when we talk about being um, bisexual. That's something that 
we're still starting to hear pretty recently before that was just the butt end of a joke. But, you know, so the more we get these terms normalized and in, in mainstream, the more we can, you know, be ourselves and, and educate and help other people to come to their true selves, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's one of the one of the pieces that I've been learning over the last year or so is the difference between like sexual attraction and like romantic attraction and mm -hmm. how how you might be sex repulsed but still love romance and so there's mm -hmm. all of these layers within asexuality that i think um allosexual folks just have no idea how many pieces yep. there are that go into that and i think allo and asexual people benefit from knowing the, that nuance because maybe you know you know wow i really want to be a romancer i don't really care about the romance part you know we could just watch tv and eat popcorn i don't need flowers or whatever like it's so it's so cool to um to have all of that um the detail i've been feeling quite a niche i'm a dumb and i've been dumbing other ace people and that's mm -hmm. been something that i've discovered that having a safe place to practice bdsm when you're sexual is something mm -hmm. that can be hard to find yeah so i've been very out there and vocal about um dumbing without having the aspect of sexuality there's tons of stuff that you can do when you dumb that isn't necessarily sexual so mm -hmm. that's another thing i've been less here because let's keep this friendly but <laughs> um pg-13 but yeah that's something i've been advocating you know bdsm is not only for sex it can be a great way to connect or to treat anxiety i had some friend who had fibromyalgia that would do some bdsm it would relieve their pain so mm -hmm. it's a whole nother can of worm but yes uh, it's it's very fluid it's incredibly fluid yeah uh we have a question from the chat what is allosexual would you mind answering that for us of course so asexual is someone who doesn't have the I call it instinct. I know it's not probably the right word, but the instinct or the desire to have sex. So allosexual is the opposite of asexual. It's someone who actually has these sex impulse, um, has the needs to have sex, has a libido. So anything that's related to the desire, the impulse of having sex falls under the allosexual. Then you have asexual. Mm -hmm. It's also the same for aromantic and alloromantic. So um, they're often kind of grouped together, asexuality and aromat er aromantic. Yeah. There mm -hmm. you go. <laughs> um, so both starts with A, but they're, they're like, we use the same wording for these two. So alo means kind of it, yes, and A means no. So asexual, no sex, alosexual, yes, sex. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, um, very... Um, with their proper uh, uh, lingo there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's like people like learning right now while we're talking. Yeah, good. Excellent. <laughs> it's so fun. That's the point of this, right? It's like to educate yes. each other and like mm -hmm. enthusiastically be like, oh my gosh, let's yeah. talk about it. It's it's like a bunch of neurodivergent yeah. people in the same room geeking out about exactly. gender and sexuality yes. right now. <laughs> and it's the kind of conversation that is great to have and it's great to have a safe space to do it too. Mm -hmm. it's very important to have this space to do it and i'm very glad that you created that kudos to you for that Aw, thanks um why is it important to set aside arguments about queer eligibility um or that gatekeeping sort of mm -hmm. behavior and build bridges between queer generations so I personally never had a mentor because all the people died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. My people who would have been my mentor died of AIDS. So I want to be there for the younger generation because I didn't have that. I had to seek out the queer history by myself. I didn't have anyone giving me, you know, when I talked about the asexuality a culture earlier, that's something that is almost dead. Like there's almost, there's almost like no one remembers all of this. So by having it, you know kept on record on here would always have hey at least I said all these ace thing will be in this little time capsule forever so we lost so much and I don't want it to keep going I want our history to be written down I want our story to be heard I want people a hundred years a thousand years from now to be able to hear our story because we 
have so little stories of the one who came before us, we need to record as much as we can, preserve as much as we can, educate as much as we can, and ensure that the next generation is ready to pick up the fight, to keep on getting the momentum going, get you know, keep on getting rights, keep on helping people, creating those strong communities, maybe with pride, maybe with family, maybe with polycule, no matter the way you see it, it is important to mm -hmm. surround yourself, not only online, but in real life with people that will understand you and support you. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're so lucky. They're so lucky. They're, I don't know if they realize how lucky they are. I, I look at the kids today and I'm just, I'm so happy for them that they don't have to struggle like we did. Yeah. I would never want them to go through what we went through because why, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's so terrifying to see, for example, let's backtrack one second. So with the AIDS thing, um, mm -hmm. we have to be very careful with the monkeypox going on right now. Yeah. So that is something that we have to be very careful. The way it has been worded, the way it has been um, talked about and hey, push for vaccine, you know, hey, um, gay men should go get the vaccine right now and putting the emphasis on queer people having this disease. So this is why it's very important to know, hey, when AIDS happened, what did they do? So mm -hmm. we need to look at the past to know how we're going to handle the future because it's coming. Yeah. It is coming and we have to be strong and we have to stand together to defend. And I see this monkey butt things. It has been stressing me a bit, I must admit, because the way it has been worded. And that's why I would really want to see queer people just letting go of all this infighting going on and just focus on supporting and giving the right message on what's going on with the monkeypox right now, because it could go really bad real quick. Mm -hmm. Well, not to be too too much of a doom person. No, but the... <laughs> it's it's important to talk about, you know. Yes. It's um and media that was made about AIDS is still popular today. Like look yep. at the musical mm -hmm. Rent. I Rent. just went and saw mm -hmm. that in person like a month or two ago. Like it's um it's incredible how that play written in I think the nineties is still, yes. you know, about 30 years later, still very popular. And so they did a great movie version in 2005 yeah. too. I, I love that movie. I have the soundtrack and yeah. about the, the DVD and I had the, the poster on I my wall as a teenager. Oh, so good. <gasps> what a great show. Oh, I adore Rent. <laughs> It took a month to get those songs out of my head after seeing it. I'll oh, probably yeah. be back tonight. <laughs> I'll be falling asleep. One song, Glory. One song, <laughs> yeah. Glory. Just, I, I'll, I'll be like doing the dishes or something, and then I'll be mumbling One song, Glory. I just, <laughs> oh. yeah. So friends. <laughs> I love it so much. Yes, musicals. Eh? That's just, musical have a special place in my heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mercedes has a comment in the chat. The way monkeypox is being advertised is solely for men of all sexualities and genders, but not for trans women has been really interesting, frowny face. Um, interesting. Yeah. Interest. See, we're already seeing the flaws. Like, this yeah. is why we have to stay on top of it, stay educated about it, and, you know, tell your trans friends, go get the vaccine. You know, we have to support each other and ensure that what happens during the egg crisis doesn't happen to us again. We have to learn from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. We do. Yeah. We but do. thank you for pointing that out. That is something that we need to think to. We need to include our trans sister in that too. We mm -hmm. do. Yeah. Yep. So let's see. Is there a specific generation of queer people that you look up to, Nick? Um, I really admire the younger generation, personally. I think that it's so great that they're so vocal. They're so... I just admire everything that they keep fighting for. Um, I strongly believe that the youth are going to save us. Um, you go, guys. I will cheer for you. I will help you. I just... I'm so proud of the younger generation. I really am. Um, so I just have about three questions left. Yep. Um, is there anything about 
intergenerational trans connections or asexuality or any of the other things we've discussed today you want to make sure you say that you haven't had a chance to say yet um tattoos for me tattoo was um an exploration of gender for you it took me years before i started to get tattoos i was kind of a little chicken about it also grew strongly catholic so you know thy body thy temple etc etc um, tattoos for me were such a great discovery for gender euphoria. I started to have tattoos on my arms uh, four years ago. And um, shout out to my tattoo artist, um, amazing Leo. Um, they are great. Um, I, we will shout out later their studio. Go see their stuff. They're great. And they really helped me step into owning. It was just, I started to get tattoos just before I got my top surgery, just before I all my surgery. So they really helped me validate my gender and help me power through and, you know, accept myself and be ready for my surgery. It really, you know, just getting myself prepared for needles and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So it was just really, it was really an empowering experiment to get tattoos. And, and now I'm, completely addicted i adore getting tattoos it's just so so validating so fun oh my gosh i only have one tattoo it's the symbol of leo over my heart and it's got rainbow running through it oh that's amazing that's i have so a fun. coffin for my top surgery and i have a coffin for my um hysterectomy so nice one coffin for each organ i lost <laughs> there you go now you really can't have children people can step off yes exactly <laughs> and still still on my to-do me, list <laughs> that second yeah. thing <laughs> yeah that's gonna be actually i'm gonna talk a bit more to that when you're gonna ask about gender for yeah because that was my whole thing was well, yeah that. let's talk let's talk about it now share an experience of gender euphoria with the with the audience yeah, so I thought top surgery would be the biggest gender for you thing because I've wanted top surgery since I was 13. But for me, it was the first month that I didn't have my period. That was mm-hmm. the biggest gender for you I've ever felt in my life. I didn't think it would impact me this much. I hate having periods so much. Mm-hmm. It's such, it was hard on my mood. It was on my body. It was hard on everything. First month I didn't have to deal with that was just amazing for me. More than the top surgery it was just instant relief for me. Yeah, that's yeah. so awesome. You yeah, know, the I kicked in. It stopped, and I was like, "Yes, yeah, yeah. I love that." So I've I've yeah. had an IUD for a couple of years, which has ceased the bleeding part of my period, but I think there's still other symptoms that I've got going on like yeah. mood swings and bloating and mm. like cramps and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I'm very, I'll be very curious to see how that th- piece shifts. Like I get really dysphoric on like Sundays and Mondays, which are the two days before my next T dose I'm on injections. Yeah. And I'm also curious if that's part of it too. It's like, it's because the, yeah. the estrogen is like fighting back. <laughs> like, yeah. No, too much. Slow down. For me it was hip pain. I used to have like, hip pain and my hip would be swollen i couldn't wear certain pants during my period because my hips were so swollen Mm -hmm. yeah it was it was brutal my periods were brutal so when they stopped i was like this is the best thing literally this is the best thing ever Mm -hmm. yeah wow some things to look forward to (laughs) yes yes and it everyone goes to their own rhythm everyone has their own journey but everyone will get where they want to go. Mm-hmm. I strongly believe that as long as you work for your goal, you will get where you want. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So what would you like to make sure folks know about your perspective on gender and non-binary or trans issues? If you had like a 30 second soapbox moment, what would you make sure people hear? Live and let live, but be supportive. Mm. Yeah. I love yeah. That. Yeah. Let people do what they want, but be there and support them because we're in a society, we're in a community, we live together, we have to support each other, we have to be kind to each other, and we have to, you know, make our part to make the world better a little bit at a time. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, well, thank you so much, Nick, for being my guest today. I don't know if those listening to the podcast will have heard the grins we both had on our face this entire <laughs> conversation, but like my face is like starting to hurt the tiniest bit in the best way from smiling this whole time. Um, yeah. 
So I wanted to make sure to leave a little bit of time for our cross promo here at the end. So you mentioned your blog and your tattoo artist. Yes. Do you want to say anything more about those two things? So as I said, I am obsessed with Our Flag Mean Death. I run a blog where I reblog every single art that I can find of Our Flag Mean Death. Every single art may be a drawing made on paper to the most rendered picture that took 15 hours. It doesn't matter to me. If it's a fan art of Earth Like Mean Death, I would like and reblog it on that blog. Yes. And shout out to my tattoo artist, Leo, from the Iris Brass Studio in Victoria, BC. Um, they also have a queer shop, the Queer Collective. So if you're around there or if you want to shop on their shop, go ahead. They're an amazing person and they have, they're have they great artists. They made most of my tattoos. They helped me step into my power with tattooing and gender euphoria. So huge shout out to them. I love it. Well, um, thank you so much, Nick, for joining us today here on Genderful. Um, I Just so that folks in the chat know, our guest uh, in two weeks is going to be Christopher Akonomo. Icon, Iconomu, I'm pretty sure I'm saying uh, Zem's name incorrectly. <laughs> Please forgive me, Christopher. Um, and we're <laughs> going to be discussing being a disabled trans artist. Who knows? Maybe there'll be some Our Flag Means Death art that we can have Nick reblog. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> yes, that would be amazing. <laughs> so for now, Jennifer would like to thank our guests for being on this podcast. Please feel free to join us live on our Twitch on Mondays. Check out the replays on YouTube on Fridays. Keep an eye on your favorite podcasting platforms for edited audio-only versions. As Nefer Kitty says, trans rights are human rights. That's right.